Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Abby Vasoulis. I'm a reporter at Time Magazine covering economic policy and Congress as well. Uh, today, we're talking about the employment conundrum. COVID has created a massive pool of recently unemployed people. Some initially worked from home, others were furloughed, uh, but many were redundant. And as the U.S. is reviving, many unemployed seem reluctant to return to work. Unemployment is at record lows. Uh, what is causing this? Aren't employers creating attractive enough jobs with good pay? As technology is increasing, have potential job candidates become unskilled through lack of retention? What structural shifts are occurring in the offing? My first question is for Jeff Abbott, who is the CEO of Avanti, an asset management software system that helps companies resolve tech issues remotely. He has over 25 years of experience working in the enterprise software space for companies, including Accenture. Jeff, my question for you is outside of wage increases, how do you retain highly skilled employees in the incredibly competitive tech industry? Yeah, first of all, thanks, Abby, for having me and, and welcome, everyone. It's interesting. Like, uh, like a lot of industries in high tech, we're seeing more people change jobs and droves than, than we have in a long time. You know, in the U.S., we're actually calling it the great resignation. And we see essentially two big drivers in the challenge to retain talent. We recently did a study. Uh, and, and surveyed a, a wide swath of our customers and, and the challenges they're seeing with their employees. First big driver is the flexibility of where they work. And in fact, the recent study we conducted assessed the sentiments of employees and asked them where they would prefer, you know, what kind of flexibility would they prefer in terms of coming back to work? 71% said they prefer having the ability to work from anywhere at any time. 51% said they would be willing to take a pay cut if it could mean they could work anywhere at any time. So essentially what we're saying, what we're seeing is, is this desire for uh, the employee choice, the employee preference. And in fact, we've seen a few companies kind of midway through the pandemic, Abby, they, they made a, a, a rather aggressive decision to push employees to come back to the offices and a lot of them quit. And I'm talking about big brand companies. I won't mention them, but we're talking about recognizable home home known brands that, that kind of said, it's time to come back and employees said, I don't think so, and took their talents elsewhere. Second driver, and this is very interesting to me, research is showing that the best talent are not only motivated by the ability to work wherever they want, but they want more than compensation in terms of their connection to their company. So employees are saying, I, I wanna be connected to a mission and a set of core values that I share, a common purpose with, uh, with how I think about the world and what our product or service should be doing to better the world. Um, and in fact, again, the research is showing that employees who feel more connected to the mission and core values of the corporation are three times more likely to stay and invest more. So that actually caused us at Avanti, we, we've recently done four or five acquisitions. It's very difficult when you put four or five companies together at the same time and create a common culture. So we introduced a set of mission and core values. We surveyed the employees on what was really important to them. And, and the core values that we, we came up with were authentic and true to who these employees are. And we're seeing a greater uh, score in employee engagement and a drop in attrition as a result. I, I just think it's, it's becoming a, a much more interesting workforce that doesn't care as much as it used to about paychecks and uh, office hours and more so wants flexibility and connection. Thank you, Jeff. My next question is for Rula. Rula is the founder of Intuition Consultancy in Egypt, which supports brands with creating long-term strategy. Some of her clients have included UNICEF and the Hamza Group for Sustainable and Integrated Water Solutions. She was previously an advisor uh, to Egypt's Minister of International uh, Cooperation. Uh, Rula, over the past year, workers' hourly pay has increased by almost 5%. A good company culture, things that Jeff talked about, are certainly important, as are perks like paid time off and, and health care. But employers have to offer strong wages, too, especially as inflation in the United States is up over 5%. You've consulted with a lot of companies. Do you think employers understand the importance of offering competitive wages to their employees? How can that be cheaper for them in the long run to be able to employ, uh, to offer good wages to keep people around? 
Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be uh, joining everyone from Cairo. Um, it's pretty interesting because as I, I've been consulting a lot of governments and, and private sector companies over the years, and it's, it's really very obvious how the people element is becoming much more stronger in any strategic uh, deck that we present way forward. 71% of executives right now feel the pressure of changing working policies and adapting new working models. Like Jeff was saying, it's not just about a salary or a compensation, but it's also very much about culture and mission. And you know, we used to see these words on, on walls in an office before, but now they're really core to what uh, people are looking for. Um, I always say it's not about bringing people back to work, but uh, it's about bringing people forward at work. And this is something that we're seeing very much um, as a result of the great resignation or, you know, the great realization that it's not just about the salary, but also about the other perks that we get. Obviously, salary is very, very important. And businesses that do not look at the wage structure right now um, are very short uh, sighted. Uh, because losing talent, their com competition is very fierce, right? And as we we're seeing more and more people quit their jobs, we're seeing more people get hired in new jobs, right? And so if we don't retain our current um, workforce through uh, proper compensation, then it's going to actually affect affect the profit margin uh, because of inconsistencies, because of lack of services, because of lack of you know delivery. If we have a logistics center. So this is really becoming a very important topic. And it's not just about adjusting salaries, but it's also about having these adjustments happen regularly. So on a quarterly basis, we can have a compensation pulse, which is a dialogue with people. Is this sufficient? Is this not sufficient? So really it's about people policies, people practices, but also people preferences. And this is where empathy on great leadership, like Jeff was saying, comes in play, right? So we have to have this transparent, effective dialogue happening with employees all the time in, in order to be able to retain them um, as, as long as we can. I saw a headline uh, earlier this month that said that if if your company is not offering you at least a 5% raise this year, then they're actually giving you a pay decrease. So do you think it's important to not only have cost of living adjustments as one separate thing, but then also have merit increases as, a, as another thing? Like are, to you guys and anyone can jump in here, do you feel like these are two very separate things or should they ever um, happen in a combined way? Jeff, we can't hear you. Sorry, thank you, Rula. So it's hard to separate these things. Uh, they're all related, right? Uh, and the variables that we all have to consider as leaders uh, on what the workforce is motivated by uh, swirls. And right now, like never before, right? Whether, as, as Rula was saying, whether it's mission, core values, connection, transparency of leadership, compensation, and so on. Um, I wrote down what you said just now, Abby, because if 5% is the new minimum, I need to check on our budget for this year's raise pool. <laughs> Um, I think we're we're okay. We're above that, but not by much. So it, it, I think, look, um, you know, these are things we're all going to have to consider depending on our organizations, depending on the level of attrition, depending on the employee engagement scores. And if you're not scoring your organization, I highly recommend you do. As Rula said, the more you can reach out and, and talk to your employees about where they are and what they're thinking and, and so on. It didn't used to be this way. It used to be it was just a it was a given that, you, you know, it was, you had a lock on a set of talent and uh and actually, it was the, the organizations kind of calling the shots on where they would place their talent. The roles have changed, right? The talent is now saying, I'm going to evaluate you, and I'm going to make sure that this is somewhere I want to be. So I think, you know, Abby, I think it's, it's, it's a part of a, a mix. You have to evaluate all of it. Great. I, I do have one more follow-up. I, I think this, what Rula said is so fascinating. Um, so... I've been reading a lot about how companies in this great resignation market are starting to, maybe some did it before, but but more often now companies are reaching out to their employees and saying, hey, we really value you. How can we make sure that you stay? So before an employee comes to you and says, I have an outside offer, can you match it? Companies are starting to reach out to their employees and say, we want to invest in you now so you aren't looking for an outside offer. Um, do you guys think, this is good strategy. Should companies be employing this more often, starting to proactively go to their employees and offer 
uh, raises, perhaps even before that employee asks for it? I would, can I jump in here, Abby? So I'll give you, I'll give you an example on this and, and it, it really does feel that the employee today is the empowered one, right? The, the, this entire shift is causing people to feel very empowered. And there's this sense of confidence that I, ac I can actually leave if I'm unhappy or I can leave a place if I'm not being treated well. So these are like two really big uh, overarching themes. We see, for example, in the Middle East, I'll give an example. The government of Dubai just launched a new policy, which is called the Smart Savings Policy. And it's, it's, it's being launched to the public sector and the private sector, where every single employee is now, um, uh, the business or the institution needs to offer them a savings uh, uh, you know, fund, for example, for them to be able to uh, save. And when they retire, they take their, the, the money, et cetera. This wasn't there before. This isn't here, for example, in Egypt. It's not something that we normally see. And having such policies included right now is, is, just, is not just to gain new uh, talents, but also to retain the current talents. So these are things that are outside the norm that are being done it's a conversation that governments and private sector businesses are having because it's such a big deal right so um the quit rate is a is a is, a, is at an all-time high and and the this continuous improvement of um working models needs to effectively include what people want and this is obviously based on uh, a lot of the surveys that dubai has been making uh for their people i just Thanks. add abby it's in the remote workforce, it's difficult. You know, uh, managers are used to being able to uh, walk down the hallway or, or, you know, pop into a conference room and have a conversation live with, with their workforce and under, you can get a, a sense of where people are with that live human connection. More difficult when it's remote, right? So yes, I think, I think proactively reaching out and proactively perhaps, you know, putting uh, some measures in place, either compensation-wise or bonus-wise, for those that might appear to be considering leaving. We're all doing that. Everyone's doing that, right? We're actually in the software industry starting to develop tools to measure real-time employee engagement, right? Sort of an early warning system for managers to watch and make sure that they're getting the right uh, productivity, but also it's not, it's not a policing system. It's more just understanding, you know, are, is engagement where it needs to be? And, and are we seeing the kinds of behaviors that you know, are common with happy employees. Employees, as Rula said, are engaged and interested in what they're doing. Um, and when they're not, now the onus is on the company to react, right? And the managers need to need these tools to kind of understand where they are. It's it's a difficult situation, but I actually agree with Rula. There's the, the empowerment that's occurring is a good thing. It's a very good thing because think of it. If you do have a set of talent that is happy and highly engaged, level of productivity you get goes through the roof, right? And it becomes a strategic competitive advantage. So ignoring it and just saying, well, we're just going to have 30% attrition. Mm -mm, it's not going to work. You're going to find yourself in a bad place uh, and, and getting more and more in tune with your, with your workforce is going to be more and more paramount to competing. Jeff and Rula, thank you so much. Those are great insights. Next, I want to jump to Amir. Amir is the co-founder of Curry Up Now, an award-winning fast casual restaurant chain that serves Indian food with a modern twist. He is also the CEO of Checks.ai, a tech solution for vehicle inspections, such as the ones that uh, are required to drive for ride sharing apps like Uber. Amir, I am wondering what economic shifts have hindered the ability of companies like restaurants, like small business chains, to recruit entry level wage workers. If you drive down Main Street, you see you know, dozens of, of small restaurants and, and restaurant chains that have help wanted signs on the windows. It seems like they're struggling a little bit more than other sorts of companies, maybe tech companies, uh, to recruit workers. Uh, why is that? And what can businesses in that kind of situation do uh, to hire? You know, what's interesting is that uh, lack of talent in retail and restaurant has always been an issue. It's been an issue for many years. It was just so exasperated over the last, uh, I would say, two years. Um, what I would like to think and what I believe most is that people don't work for the company. They work for their management. They work for the leadership, those who they're in contact with every day. And that's the same for small business owners. Um, and one of one of 
the telltale signs for me as to whether or not, you know, we're doing a good job, um, whether it's, you know, in a specific location or it's a specific department is whether or not there's a high turnover rate. Um, and I see that we're most successful in markets or in locations when the turnover rate is not very high. And that's usually attributed to the leadership there, whether it's management, um, whether it's your core team. I think in any industry, you know, that core team really echoes the way the brand um, depicts itself, not only for customers, but for the people that work for the company. And, you know, your biggest reps are employees, right? If you have happy employees, they're giving great customer service, you're getting great reviews, and it's and it's great for the business because now you can think about how to scale next and, and uh, which markets to go. Uh, so I would say the number one thing is leadership uh, that ties into culture. Uh, I'd like to echo um, that generally pay isn't always the number one thing. I think for my for that space in retail, it does help significantly because we're talking about lower wages and um, and, you know, giving finding that fair wage in that market is very difficult because you're dealing with very small margins. So you really ultimately have to um, do a really good job on the people side. Uh, and I think that translates a lot to to uh, how the customer views the brand and how you can grow the company. I'll stop there, see if you have any follow-ups. So are you saying that an extra 50 cents to a dollar an hour can really make the difference here? And, and how can that end up saving a, a company money by just doing smaller wage increases how does that pay off in the long run for for a company's bottom line you know it's not just the 50 cents or the dollar it's the workload right because if you're paying someone even 20 bucks an hour and they're doing the work of three people they're going to burn out so you have to find that balance of of you know how to make it fun while they're there uh optimize the workload um utilize technology so i think uh, in our space, like technology has uh, become such a huge part where it wasn't 10 years ago. 10 years ago, it was just emerging. But in the last three, four years, there are so many tools available to make work easier. Uh, so you just have to find the balance to, to let your people work smarter and not harder. As as much as it, you know, as an operator, you're like, what what is this thought? Like, you know, you don't want your people to work hard. But I found that, um, that you know, having the team work smarter and... The, the one thing I forgot to mention is opportunity, right? You have to be able to show people opportunity. Um, you have to show your people opportunity because if they're stuck in the same role and they're not learning anything new, they're not going to stay. Uh, nobody wants to do the same thing over and over again for the rest of their lives. They want to grow uh, in your organization. And if you can facilitate that for them, um, they'll stay with you forever. And I've had, I have people today um that are still working in, in, in my company that started 11, 12 years ago, which is unheard of in our space. And they're, you know, they're leadership in that company. Um, and so that's really amazing to see. They built their whole families around, around our company. Um, and it's just, it's just wonderful. Jeff or, or perhaps Diana, do either of you want to jump in and talk about how you manage to make sure that your employees don't get burned out? Yeah, I'll jump in. I mean, I would say the third sector, the nonprofit world where we're on the front lines of anti-human trafficking, um, there's very high turnover and I'm very proud our retention extremely high. We're a 10 year old organization and many of our staff have been with us for eight years, seven years. And so what we do is really focus on people, um, investments, making sure that uh, our employees feel heard, feel seen, feel inspired, feel empowered, and also um, are advancing within the organization. And that's quite frankly, very challenging in the nonprofit world, but we do that through uh, quarterly retreats where we bring all of our team uh, to different locations and we focus on our quarterly goals, vision casting, um, also re, you know, re-engaging individuals on our mission so that every individual can tell their know me network story. Um, so it's a lot of real, I would say, um, I don't want to say fluffy, but just really, really kind of engage individuals at that 
uh, level where they can feel connected to the mission and the work because not everyone is traveling overseas to deploy our programs. And then second, I would say um, is really, um, you know, we're not like competitive in terms of Facebook or Dropbox offering concierge services to employees. But we do know every employee's birthday and we do little things, you know, send them a birthday cake now that it's virtual. But when it was in person, we would have, you know, birthday parties and celebrations are really big on celebrating those milestones as well. So those are just some of the things that we do. I don't know if Jeff has anything to add. Those are great. Um, we, we also have a, a little award program where uh, you get coins and you, uh, you accrue coins over the, the, the months of service. And the idea is not that you retain the coins, it's that you give them to, to colleagues, to from peer to peer managers, to, to employees and so on. And then they can be spent on, uh, on a catalog on, on Amazon. Um, so, uh, you know, to Diane's point, we're, you know, we're trying to create more connection through uh, peer to peer recognition and so on. And then we also uh, have a couple of little things. And we just implemented a program where this coming spring, Every other Friday afternoon, everybody takes off, you know, uh, yeah, paid vacation, just take half the day off just to get out and re-energize and so on. And that's kind of, kind of part of our thinking on recovery from COVID. Let's get people out and about and, you know, feeling good about uh, taking a break and a breather, because I think my colleagues would agree it's still a high pressure work situation around the world. Everybody's trying to perform. And so that's a measure we take. And then we also have uh, Fridays at noon, which is there's 3000 employees in my company and Fridays at noon, we randomly put one on one 15 minute coffee talks together right through through a web conference where and, and they're on my calendar too, where essentially we're just saying just meet, just introduce yourselves anywhere in the world, any different role to role, just say hello and get you know to know each other and know what, what each other does. It's those kinds of things. And I, you know, I, I don't think, you know, to Diana's point, I don't think that's ducks and bunnies management. I think it's a critical part of now the new environment is, especially in large multinational sales companies and including nonprofits, you've got to make these kinds of moves to, to create, again, the culture you want. And that becomes part of retention, employee satisfaction and so on. So we're glad to make steps like that. I love the idea of summer Fridays, whether they're every week or every Abby, week. I want you to take this afternoon off. <laughs> I'll let my bosses know. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so I do want to jump back to uh, Diana uh, to introduce her uh, to you guys. She's the president and a co-founder of Nomi Network, a nonprofit organization uh, that bridges the private, public, and nonprofit sectors through enterprise and education with the goal of ending human trafficking. Uh, she serves on the White House Public-Private Partnership Advisory Council to end human trafficking as well. Diana, my question for you uh, is that you employ people in multiple countries. What are the perks and the challenges of that? Uh, one seems to be that you have to um, get up at, at odd hours sometimes. Um, but should more businesses look to diversify the regions from which they hire in light of the employment crunch uh, in the United States? Yeah, that's a really great question, um, Abby. I would say we are, um, as I mentioned, a workforce development and training agency for survivors of human trafficking. So we really focus on very marginalized communities in rural areas. And so working in India, Cambodia, um, and also the U.S. now with close to 100 employees, um, we really kind of see, um, you know, the benefits uh, of operating in each of the regions. So some of the perks um, for us working in India and Cambodia is access to talent pools, specifically in the more, um, you know, I would say uh, poor performing states in terms of social economic indicators. Uh, when we put up a job post, we get hundreds of applicants because there's a strong demand for good jobs. And in these regions, working in a nonprofit is more stable than, you know, in many cases, the private sector. And so in the U.S., though, we are experiencing some difficulties on the recruiting um, front, especially with frontline staff, case managers, mental health workers, because there's a shortage in the workforce specifically. There's a high demand for those services. And so India, for example, you know, we um, are seen as a best in class employer. 
And a lot of the practices and, um, you know, tactics that we've implemented in India, I think in the United States, we're not as competitive, you know, compared to Google, compared to Salesforce. Some of our employees come from, uh, you know, McKinsey and other firms as well. So in price um, and in wage, we definitely don't necessarily compete. However, if we were to translate that into Bihar, India, um, which is oftentimes by diplomats um, referred to as the Afghanistan of India, we are more competitive. And so I would say with that comes a lot of perks of attracting top talent in those areas. And then uh, in terms of the HQ functions and the fact that we started working remotely during the pandemic and continue to do so, we're seeing um, just more mobility and applicant pools from less competitive markets. So it allows us to make hires and access uh, talent where the cost of living is lower and we're able to tap into a larger talent pool because I think our mission uh, really attracts a very unique, intrinsically motivated workforce, which is the benefit of being a organization with such a, you know, that is mission driven, I would say at this moment in time. But the challenges that we have are really, I would say, operating um, in these different countries as well. Operating India alone is, in essence, a land of many countries within one country. So maintaining the consistent organizational culture, um, we are a very horizontal culture. And when we go into India and operate there, they are uh, culturally really more hierarchical. So it's very uncommon for someone who is, um, you know, mid-level management being in touch with the CEO of the company, where it's not transparent in terms of that type of access. And so we, um, you know, operating in those countries, it's quite challenging in terms of really, I would say, um, the consistency of the mission and values communicated and really the model by example. So we spend a lot of time with our managers and really instilling that culture as well as um, values and training and investment into them as individuals to make sure that they are able to really, um, you know, impart that to our frontline staff, especially because they're the ones working directly with our clients. Thank you, Diana. Does anybody else here employ internationally? Jeff, do you have anything to add about the, the perks and the challenges of, of doing that? Yeah, I, I agree with everything Diana said. It is challenging. And in India in particular, for years, uh, what we've learned is that, yes, you need to have a, a corporate connection to your staff in India. And we have employees in Mumbai, uh, Hyderabad, Bangalore, and so on. It's a big, obviously, big uh, country in, in terms of tech skills. Um, and Abby, what we've done is established uh, kind of local budgets for celebrations and for outings and for connections, because to, to Diana's point, that's a culture within a culture, right? And in, in India, uh, locally, they need to feel that there are, the hierarchy is respected, of course, but there's, a, there's also a sense of community in each office, in each of the cities in India that we see. And then we actually have an India uh, country manager that kind of then will travel and see all of the different employees and again create a sense of community and then it's important for at the corporate level for senior executives to travel to those cities and show appreciation for those staff. Um, it, it is a challenge because I agree with with the hierarchical comment Diana made um, but it's not impossible right again this is just deliberate leadership and deliberate connection to the different communities and their local cultures I would say and there are places in Asia Pacific that are similar Right. That where you have to respect kind of locally how they, they, the different teams operate and connect to the mission. But if you put those kind of deliberate, uh, transparent plans together and, and get into motion with those organizations, again, you will get productivity. You will get connection and you will get happier employees. Kind of uh, jumping off this international discussion, I'm wondering if any of you feel that you have been impacted by global migration patterns. Uh, maybe a mirror. I mean, I know that in the restaurant industry, it used to rely a lot on um, immigrants to the United States, but immigration numbers to the United States are down considerably compared to um, previous decades uh, in light of um, some Trump administration policies that made it a little more difficult to immigrate here. Have 
global migration patterns affected um, your companies at all? This is open to anybody, but Amir might want to start. You know, it, it depends on the market. Um, I think that's probably the first thing is, you know, whether or not uh, there's sufficient rules for that market for people to kind of pick and choose from. I mean, some markets, there are just not as many opportunities as others. Um, uh, so I think it's the first and uh, foremost thing that we look at. The other is if if our uh, if our leadership in the local level is doing a good job, they're generally able to attract uh, uh, talent consistently, even throughout periods of difficulty, just because the employee again becomes your biggest um, supporter. So those employees can then bring um, people for your store when you need them, especially if you're working in a, in a retail environment. So we've seen a lot of that. Um, I think it's across the board where where if you can provide opportunity, you can provide uh, the opportunity for growth, you provide a good working environment, you pay more than fair wages, uh, you don't necessarily have that issue for the most part. And that's kind of what I've seen. Whereas we can have a store that's underperforming because maybe leadership has not been there a long time, there's high turnover, um, you know, and I, I think what that does is that creates an environment of consistent stress at work. And when you have a consistent environment of stress at work, you're going to have difficulty keeping that store staffed appropriately. What does your hiring outreach look like? I mean, it might depend on a store by store, or region by region basis, but is it just putting a help wanted sign in the window? Is it using places like Indeed to, to post job offerings? Is it posting on social media sites like Facebook? How do you recruit employees? So I'm a huge proponent of uh, ATS systems, applicant tracking systems. Um, I think one of, so a piece of technology, there's a piece of technology that we use specific for hiring and recruiting hourly workers. And what I like to do is, is centralize that recruit, that employment recruitment funnel. Um, so we, you know, centralize the job post that goes out to every, all the indeeds that are available. Uh, and, what that does is, is it creates uh, a very streamlined way for us to recruit employees. Uh, what One thing that I've learned over the years is that, you know, your response rate to an applicant who's uh, who you respond with an email is going to be maybe 30 percent. But if you change this and you respond to them in text message, you get a response in the 90s. And in our space, if you're getting a response in the 90s, then you can get them in as quickly as possible and you can figure out if they're a qualified candidate. So it's just small things that you have to do. Uh, in recruitment that uh, that really work within that that em employee sphere of communication, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Diana, what tools do you use to recruit employees? Um, in Cambodia, we use Facebook because Facebook, uh, you know, is widely used, including our clients are on it. And even informing them on classes, course, you know, offerings are through Facebook. Um, I would say in India, we use a recruitment firm that really uh, primarily focus on the private sector, but they have some competencies in the social sector as well. And then in the U.S., uh, primarily through our HR manager and also through recruitment agency as well. So, you know, I think for a nonprofit organization, we're not like uh, Amir, you know, constantly uh, really needing to access the talent pool. We're a bit more stable in our growth. And so we experienced a growth really spurt prior to COVID. And we, um, during COVID, you know, our employees were willing to take a 40% pay cut during the height of the uh, pandemic. And so um, we had to do that because, you know, we as a nonprofit rely heavily on uh, philanthropic dollars. And so we kind of looked at, you know, forecasting and just really expected that. And so we asked our senior level management and our whole entire staff to do that. And they were willing, of course, since then we've made adjustments and everyone has gotten a raise, uh, performance-based raise, but um, you know, that just kind of shows you in terms of um, case in point, intrinsically motivated and really engagement of uh, the people is very, very important and critical because that's what keeps them and even making willing to make those sacrifices in your company. Great, thank you. Um, so 
one pretty sweeping question I have is a, is a huge problem. Um, I don't think that we can solve it uh, today on this panel, but um, there is, uh, the economists consider full employment to be um, around a 5% unemployment rate. Right now we're below that in the United States. It's around four, four and a half percent unemployment. So part of that is because that people during the pandemic started retiring early or deciding that if they lived in a dual income household, that they didn't want to have both adults in that household work. Uh, so how can businesses engage workers who are not even considering joining the labor pool right now? What kinds of things can you do? Perhaps uh, offering daycare on on company premises or instituting more um, kind of gig work kind of roles in order to fill the openings that, that your companies or the companies that you consult have. Um, maybe Rula, you can start. How would you advise a company that is struggling to fill roles in, in retaining and in recruiting people that maybe aren't actively seeking jobs right now? I think, Abby, in general, the free, freelance revolution is, is about to start. Um, I think this is truly accelerated, obviously, with the pandemic. But today, a lot of people working are having second gig jobs and a lot of people that are not willing to work full time are working on freelance platforms right and so the pool of talent doesn't have to be a full-time employee anymore you can actually get talents to work with you on their time and on with their lifestyle etc so for example mothers retired um, employees etc you can actually tap into this pool through them being part of your freelance network and not necessarily your full-time employees and i think this is I think in 2030, I read online that 20, in 2030, there's going to be 500 million freelancers working. Um, and for example, so with my work, it's it's becoming more and more beneficial because I tap on to talents from everywhere around the world, not just necessarily uh, where I am, right? Um, offering flexibility, like I, I start, as, as Jeff was saying at the very beginning, so it's all about flexibility and it's all about, you know, creating that culture of transparency in order to get people to do whatever it is that you that you want them to do yeah i'll add to that um we work with a major airline and what they're doing is really trying to tap into younger talent pool so they're in their policies kind of reforming and lowering it to high school students because they're having challenges filling their operational staff so those that handle the luggage those that you know check in um, passengers. And so we're seeing a shift in companies now looking at, you know, the high school talent pool, which is very interesting and really kind of preparing them to enter the workforce and making these adjustments in their policies to do that. I think Abby, you're on mute. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I was wondering if Jeff or Amir have anything to add about how you recruit uh, people that um, maybe have retired early or um, or have decided that they're not going to be a dual income household anymore. Go ahead, Amir. You know, um, I, th I think what we're seeing, what, what I've seen actually in our space is like his historically um, retail or restaurant workers were underemployed meaning wage wise and that required them to work multiple jobs so you'd go in work eight hours at one company and then you'd have to go work eight hours or six hours at another company and that that that's one thing where i think i've seen where um where the employees now are trying to pick the employer they're most happy with and figure out a way to make that work. So we've made some adjustments to do that, to facilitate that, where we find a way to pay some overtime. Um, and this is just for our use case, where we build it, we, we build an overtime where we can keep, you know, that candidate with us, uh, or we build in some kind of bonus plan where they're not going to go anywhere else. Um, and this is specific for the hourly worker. In terms of management, like you have to be proactive on compensation and you have to be proactive uh, on showing them where that vision is. Um, I think fortunately for us and in my experience, 
uh, with the companies that I'm involved with, we haven't necessarily had too much of a great resignation resignation issue. Um, and that allowed us to grow. That, that's allowed me to grow um, some of the other uh, uh, brands that I'm involved with. And, and really, uh, it was probably a little bit of a, last year was a different story for me, maybe than compared to uh, some of my colleagues in the space. It's, it's just, you have to, you have to, you have to be able to, you have, your team needs to be really happy with you to grow, I think for us. So. Yeah, Abby, I'll just add, uh, and I agree with all my colleagues and I align most closely probably with Rula's comment on the, the more transient uh, workforce or what many people call the gig economy, where people want to move from opportunity to opportunity. We're trying to facilitate that. We're trying to offer uh, and I'm not just talking about to Avanti, but the, the, the tech industry is trying to offer more flexibility, six months in this role, maybe six months in this role, a year in this role, and so on. Now, we've always had career progression where we have entry level and then beyond. It's gotten to where now um, career paths are just like uh, the ability to work from anywhere. Uh, career paths are becoming more flexible in terms of the variety and so on. And this next generation workforce is exactly what they want, right? They, they cringe at the thought of a hierarchical, you know, ascension into uh, into leadership or into, you know, a uh, higher wage and so on. They want to be valued for the variety they can bring. And so you know, we're we're as an industry trying to accommodate that. And as Diana said, uh, whereas we, we were kind of, I think, a little thick headed about where we would hire and the level of talent. We're now also dipping down into high school and undergraduate students. Um, uh, Internship programs are exploding now in our industry. And in fact, interestingly, I read an article uh, just the other day in the Wall Street that said interns are now, uh, you know, backing out of one opportunity and going to another because there's just a war to get even interns. And that didn't used to be the case. You know, you, you'd be overflowing with interns. So I think it is changing and, and you have to think differently about career pathing and development of talent. And, and you have to apply within your own organizations flexibility of role. A, a amount of time and role and so on. And interestingly, also in the United States, and I've experienced this, I have high school kids who just are in their first year of college um, and uh, friends of theirs have decided the trades are more interesting than, than college or a professional route and offer them the flexibility they want, you know, a pretty high wage right out of the gate. Uh, they don't have to wait four years to get there. And oh, by the way, they could ultimately own their own business. So this gen, the next, gen, next gen worker is thinking entirely differently about, about career progression. Great, all extremely good points. Guys, thank you all for joining this panel today. Um, I think it was incredibly insightful and any uh, employee or worker who comes across it should feel really inspired and uh, empowered to uh, start controlling a little bit more about their, their workplace and, um, and exacting maybe higher wages or a better company culture or more collaboration with uh, corporate leaders. Uh, because like we've discussed, it's, it's kind of a tight labor market out there um, and it's, it's the workers uh, time to shine here. So thank you all for joining. Um, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Abby. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. Bye-bye. Yes.